insulin resistance progressing into prediabetes, progressing into full-blown type 2 diabetes. How do you understand where you are and what really is the difference between these three things? Because they're very similar. They're ultimately just a progression of the same thing. That probably goes without saying. But if you look at the progression, you look at what our ultimate goal is, the goal is to have our muscle be a glucose sink. Okay, now people look at type 2 diabetes, they look at prediabetes, and they think it's like a circulatory thing. Like they think blood glucose and that's it but it goes much more beyond that. It's more about how do our muscles soak up glucose efficiently. And the less that our muscles are soaking up glucose, that dictates our degree of insulin resistance, prediabetes, or diabetes, okay? So the goal is to not have glucose floating around in the bloodstream at such a high degree where it ultimately gets either turned into fat or goes through what's called glycation, where basically it's like a caramelized onion, where that glucose is in your bloodstream so much that it's starting to caramelize cells and caramelize proteins, right? We don't want that. So when you have insulin resistance in any degree, it's pretty simple. Your body takes in glucose because you ate carbohydrates, and then as a result, your pancreas produces insulin. Well, that insulin circulates around, and then it binds to what is called an insulin receptor on a cell. When it binds to that insulin receptor, it triggers a transporter, something called GLUT4, to come up to the surface and take the glucose into the cell. When we are looking at insulin resistance, we're looking at a malfunction of this situation. Now, we've all experienced desensitization at some point in our lives, right? Maybe you've had a lot of caffeine and you've realized, oh wow, I need more and more and more caffeine to get the same effect. Or maybe you've experienced it with alcohol, where your tolerance to alcohol has changed. Or another analogy is white noise from a fan. You hear a fan and eventually you don't hear it anymore even though it's running. Well, it's all the same desensitization of the cells. The cells are so used to seeing high levels of glucose, they become desensitized. So your insulin sensitivity goes down, i.e. insulin resistance goes up. Since this issue applies to a cell at the sort of muscle level, at the tissue level, the pancreas is still producing lots of insulin. So you're eating carbohydrates, those carbohydrates aren't getting to the cell, so the pancreas says, uh-oh, we must need more insulin. So it starts pumping out more and more and more and more. And next thing you know, you have high levels of glucose and you're what is called hyperinsulinemic. You have high levels of insulin as well. This causes a problem, which we'll talk about in a little bit in this video, especially when it comes down to fatigue and weight gain. So think of it as sort of like a sink, okay? You have glucose that needs to go into this sink. Okay, now insulin's job is to pull the drain so that the glucose can go down the drain, okay? Now, if insulin resistance is at play, that means that the drain doesn't even respond to the hand that's pulling up the plug. So glucose and insulin just fill and fill and fill and fill this sink and nothing ever actually lets it drain. And eventually this sink spills over. And when it spills over, that's when it starts gaining fat, right? Because it's spilling over and depositing fat. Now the symptom progression might be a little bit more of a clinical thing, but here's what's interesting. If we look at the difference between insulin resistance as far as like symptomology with glucose levels compared to prediabetes and type 2 diabetes, they're very similar. What's funny, it's not really funny, it's kind of sad, is that how they classify insulin resistance is just too high. Your glucose levels are too high. That's pretty vague, right? So a lot of us could be dealing with levels of insulin resistance. Now when you move into prediabetes, they're looking at three different things. Looking at your A1C, which is your three month sort of lagging indicator of how uh, basically much glucose has glycated and affected things. Now you're looking at an A1C of 5.7 to 6.4 for prediabetes. The other way you look at it is with a fasting blood glucose test. Okay, now fasting blood glucose, they say between 100 and 125 is going to be your fasting blood glucose for prediabetes. Then the final way that they look at it is the oral glucose tolerance test. They give you some glucose and they see how quickly you respond and where your numbers go. For prediabetes, they say between 140 and 199 on an oral glucose tolerance test. So anything above these top end numbers for prediabetes, anything above those and beyond indicates full blown type two diabetes. Okay, so you're really just looking at a symptom progression giving a different name. 
A lot of these things you can test at home. Now, what I do is I wear a continuous glucose monitor. I put a link down below for Cygnos, which is a way for you to get your hands on a continuous glucose monitor yourself so you can instantaneously see how you respond to specific foods. I think this is one of the most powerful things that people can do for themselves. So I can say, eat a banana and see how I respond and see what happens to my glucose. I can eat a cookie and see if I have the same kind of response. But then I can also do some push-ups or do some squats and see how my body responds. But the cool thing about Cygnos, and again, I put a link down below so you can save a couple bucks. So that's a 15% off discount link down below in the description right there to save 15% off. They're not just a continuous glucose monitor. They are a very powerful app that uses cool algorithmic technology to help coach you through and learns your eating patterns, but also learns how your body responds. And then it gives you a specific range saying, here's your weight loss range, here's your healthy range, and here's your weight gain range. So sometimes it'll even say, hey, you're spiking out of your range, be careful, you might gain weight, you need to go for a run or walk or something. So it really acts as a really in-depth coaching system, but outside of the coaching system, you get to kind of learn how you respond. It is a game changer, so that link is down below, and whether you are concerned with insulin resistance, pre-diabetes or diabetes, it's something where you can take power into your own hands, and I sincerely believe that people should understand this, whether you're an athlete or just someone that's hanging out and trying to understand their body. So that link is down below once again for Cygnos. You can see it right below this video in the top line of the description. The next symptom progression that you might find is simple fatigue. And this happens for two pretty clear reasons, but probably more beyond this. Okay, the first reason is your cells need glucose to create ATP. If they aren't able to suck up the glucose because they're desensitized to insulin letting the glucose in, well, guess what? the cell essentially starves and it can't produce ATP. So then you get fatigued where your body tries to run on other energy systems, but it becomes difficult unless you're very adapted. Now, additionally, what ends up happening is when your glucose levels are very high, that glucose ultimately can get converted into lipids. Now, it doesn't mean that if your glucose levels are high, you're automatically going to gain fat. But if you do start creating fat from this glucose, it's called de novo lipogenesis and it's a very inefficient process. And that means it takes a lot of energy from an enzyme and a conversion uh, standpoint. So all this energy goes into creating new fat from this glucose, which drains your energy stores. Now the other piece is the glycation. When glucose levels are circulating a lot and you're starting to have this glucose caramelizing cells and caramelizing proteins, well, this alone is a very inflammatory process and it triggers interleukin-1 beta, it triggers IL-6, these interleukins, these different cytokines, and that increases inflammation, which increases pain. When you increase pain, guess what? Your perception of fatigue increases. Okay, now we gotta move into this next one, which is the category of weight gain. Now with weight gain, there's a couple different potential mechanisms that could be at play here, because the jury is still out on whether weight gain leads to insulin resistance or insulin resistance leads to weight gain. Probably a little bit of both, honestly. But if you start noticing that you're eating the exact same diet with the exact same lifestyle and you're still progressing in terms of weight gain, well, you need to be careful because that's a good indicator you might be insulin resistant. And one of the things that happens is when you eat carbohydrates, your body tries to suck those carbohydrates up and it would normally send a signal to the brain saying, hey, we're satiated, we're good. But since those carbohydrates aren't getting absorbed, the cell sends a signal to the brain, says, hey, what's going on here? You ate, but I didn't get fuel, so eat more. So it starts signaling for you to eat more and more and more, which compounds the problem. Now, the other piece is that insulin levels stay very high. Remember, the pancreas is still producing a lot of insulin. So you have an abnormality here. When the insulin levels are very high, it is blocking the fat loss effects of hormone-sensitive lipase. So insulin stands in the way of fat loss. So normally, right when you eat, literally as you're eating, you would think you wouldn't be burning fat at that point in time, right? It makes sense because insulin's present. Well, if you have a malfunction where insulin is always high, that makes it very difficult for your body to ever sort of keep the balance of weight being on and weight being off, right? Now, the other piece that we have to remember is that insulin is actually pro-lipogenic. It actually allows for sugar to go into a fat cell and actually build fat. So it's easy to gain weight when you're in this pre-diabetic insulin resistant state. My point in saying all of this is that if you start noticing that the weight gain is going faster, the fatigue is going faster and it's hockey sticking, you need to look at the oral glucose tolerance test, you need to look at that fasting glucose, you need to look at your continuous glucose monitor. The big one, the one that a lot of people don't pay attention to but it is a very clear indicator is your eyesight. 
Okay, a lot of times people don't even recognize that their eyes are having an issue until it's too late. Or they let the eyesight problem become an indicator that they were diabetic. So we've all heard of diabetic retinopathy. We, we probably know that diabetes can be bad for the eyes. But what about at an insulin resistance level? Can just being mildly insulin resistant actually cause an issue with your eyesight? Well, the Turkish Journal of Ophthalmology looked at this directly. They looked at 25 insulin resistant people and they looked at 25 control people, people that didn't have insulin resistance. And they measured something very specific near the retina. It's called the ganglion cell inner plexiform layer and it's right near the retina and the thickness of it determines the health of the eye and the health of the eyesight. Okay. They found that the insulin resistant people had a dramatically thinned layer here. Okay, that ganglion cell interplexiform layer was much thinner in the insulin resistant group compared to the non-insulin resistant group. But neither had any issues with eyesight. The insulin resistant group still was able to see just fine. What does this tell us? It tells us that even when we're younger and we're exposed to insulin resistance and dealing with this, we are damaging our eyes and we're not noticing it. So what could be happening is as we get older and our just age-related eyesight decline hits us, it could have been possibly metabolically avoided because we didn't realize that we were actually doing damage when we were just insulin resistant with too high of glucose but not clinically too high. So even insulin resistance will force the eye to create new blood vessels that then leaks blood and leaks fluid and damages the retina. And then later on, here you are 50 years old needing glasses, when in reality you could have corrected some of the issue by understanding that you were just mildly insulin resistant and you had youth on your side and you didn't have the effect on the eyes just yet. So at the end of the day, when you look at this whole thing, how do you understand the difference? If you look at insulin resistance, it's correctable, it's avoidable, it's reversible. Pre-diabetes, I would argue, my humble opinion, is probably still somewhat reversible. Type 2 diabetes is a symptom progression where you start to have damage occurring. This is the way that I look at it. Now, if you look at the clinical definition, it's just by these numbers of glucose. But my definition is when the damage starts to happen. When you actually start to damage the eyes like a longer term way and you actually start to have irreversible damage, that cannot be corrected. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel and I hope you got some value out of this video. See you tomorrow.